the National Desk, America's News, now. Now, a fierce debate over the FBI raid at former President Donald Trump's home. Republicans slamming the search as purely political. Nobody's above the law, but the law needs to be above politics. Democrats firing back, saying it was justified. It shows that they are uh, concerned that serious crimes were committed. The latest motion from the U.S. Attorney General to reveal the details of the search as calls for transparency grow. A former president should not have classified and top secret documents. Plus, a turning point in the fight against inflation. The new reports signaling sky-high prices are starting to cool off. Good to see it below $4, but it could still go a little bit lower. The items getting a little cheaper and what you'll be paying more for. And a battle brewing over the southern border between two U.S. politicians. A look at the war of words between the governor of Texas and New York City's mayor as migrants are bused from border towns to northern sanctuary cities. And how a recently repealed Trump-era border policy could make matters worse. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Eugene Ramirez, and on this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week and a look ahead at what to expect. We start with the four big stories we've been following for you this week. FBI agents executed a search warrant at former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago home, sparking calls for more transparency from the Justice Department. Several positive inflation reports show signs the U.S. economy is cooling. With back to school season in full swing, some parents concerned about whether police will be able to keep their children safe from gun violence and the CDC releasing new guidelines replacing strict COVID-19 recommendations. Newly unsealed documents reveal former President Donald Trump is under investigation for potential obstruction of justice and violations of the Espionage Act. Now, we're also learning more about what FBI agents obtained during their search at Mar-a-Lago Monday, things like top secret documents. Trump and his team pushing back claiming it was all declassified and there was no need for the search. The National Desk Sandra Elnashar has the latest from Washington. One week ago, a federal judge in Florida signed off on a search warrant giving the FBI permission to search areas of Mar-a-Lago where boxes or documents could be stored. The 20 boxes agents obtained, according to the property receipt, included a set of documents marked various classified TS SCI documents, meaning top secret or sensitive information. They also left with four other sets of top secret documents, three sets of secret documents, and three sets of confidential documents. Binders of photos, handwritten notes, and miscellaneous top secret and confidential documents, among other records. Trump claims it was all declassified and, quote, they could have had it any time they wanted without playing politics and breaking into Mar-a-Lago. He claims it was locked in secure storage. But according to the Washington Post, classified documents relating to nuclear weapons were among the items FBI agents sought, citing sources familiar with the investigation. Unclear if it involved weapons belonging to the United States or some other nation. Trump's lawyer reacting to the Post report Thursday night. I have not specifically spoken to the president about what nuclear uh, uh, materials may or may not have been in there. I do not believe there were any in there. The warrant and property receipt give some insight on the search, but what many want to know would be in other documents. Defense attorney Peter Polano. We won't understand yet how it was they got the warrant, um, what evidence they were relying on when they told the judge, we have probable cause to believe that there are relevant documents here. Republicans here on Capitol Hill are aware of this. GOP members of the House Intelligence Committee say that's why they've asked the DOJ to brief them on the national security concerns that led them to this search. We will await their rationale as to why that extreme measure was justified and not some lesser intrusive means. Garland says it's not a decision they made lightly, trying to reassure the public about the DOJ's methods as the former president and his allies continue to criticize. Upholding the rule of law means applying the law evenly, without fear or favor. Under my watch, that is precisely what the Justice Department is doing. More details of that work may soon become clear. On Capitol Hill, I'm Atrel Nishar reporting. 
And the former president also making headlines this week after he invoked his Fifth Amendment right and declined to answer questions at his deposition Wednesday. Trump says he was following the advice of his counsel, adding the FBI's recent search of his Mar-a-Lago home influenced that decision. The deposition is part of New York Attorney General Letitia James' investigation into allegations that the Trump Organization provided false financial statements to banks and to tax authorities for financial gain. Meanwhile, a federal appeals court ruling this week that former President Trump must turn over his tax returns to a House of Representatives committee. Trump can and will likely appeal all the way to the Supreme Court. He is, however, the first president in four decades not to release his tax returns. A new survey shows just how much of a toll inflation is taking on American bank accounts. According to New York Life's latest Health Wealth Watch survey, more than a third of U.S. adults are dipping into their savings to afford higher prices. 36% of people say they have withdrawn an average of over $600 during the first six months of this year. But there could be some relief on the way. New data released Thursday shows producer price index dropping to 9.8%, and that means U.S. suppliers raised prices in July at the slowest annual pace since last fall. This comes on the heel of Tuesday's Consumer Price Index, which showed Americans in July paid 8.5% more for everyday goods than they did July of last year. However, that is down from 9.1% year-over-year for the month of June. Now, despite those reports being better than expected, Americans are still up against some of the biggest price increases in decades. The National Desk's Atra el has a look at how all of this is impacting your budget. In July, Americans paid 8.5% more for everyday goods than they did in July of last year. In normal times, an 8.5% annual inflation rate would be a shocking number. But in this case, it's an improvement from June's inflation rate of 9.1%. A main driver of price relief? Gas, down 7.7% since June. By Wednesday, prices averaged less than $4 a gallon in about half the country. Good to see it below $4, but it could still go a little bit lower. Plane tickets also got cheaper, down 7.8% in July. But groceries got 1.3% more expensive. Electricity also up 1.6%. The mixture of rising and falling prices resulting in a flat monthly inflation rate. We're seeing some signs that inflation may be getting to moderate. President Biden also pointed to a stronger than expected July jobs report as proof of a resilient economy. But polls show most Americans don't share his optimism as prices are rising faster than wages can keep up. 62% disapprove of how the president's handling the economic recovery, according to a recent ABC Ipsos poll. And more than two thirds of Americans feel the economy is getting worse. When we're purchasing groceries, we have to, um, figure out how we're going to make ends meet. As economist David Wilcox explains, souring sentiment can reinforce the drivers of inflation. A worker who thinks that inflation is here for the long term is going to be more insistent on demanding a pay increase. Wilcox, who used to direct research for the Federal Reserve, says there's no doubt this is something the Fed is watching. are absolutely focused on convincing the American public they're going to conquer inflation. They've got a long way to go, with inflation more than four times higher than their 2% target. More interest rate hikes no doubt are on the way. The question is, how big will they be? And will they be able to cool the economy down without triggering a painful recession? In Washington, I'm Atrel Nishar for the National Desk, America's News Now. High inflation is expected to drive a large cost of living adjustment for Social Security recipients. Nonpartisan group the Senior Citizens League projects a potential 9.6 percent adjustment next year, and that adds up to a near $160 per month increase, or $1,900 per year. The Social Security Administration will announce that adjustment percentage in the month of October. The Uvalde community continues to demand answers from the school district over the massacre at Robb Elementary School. Right now, students are getting ready to get back to class just a few months after that mass shooting. This week, the superintendent reassuring parents and students that there will be more officers on campus this year, but some say it's just not enough. I told my son that we're going to have extra cops there, you know? And he said, but who cares about the cops? They're not going to do anything anyway. Now, that intense exchange putting a spotlight on school security. The National Desk's Ryan Smith taking a look into the strained relationship between parents and the officers that are tasked with keeping their children safe. The governor of Texas making a major announcement this week. Enhanced security measures in Uvalde 
As students there return to school next month, but a security expert tells me it's no surprise parents, students and staff are skeptical following May's school shooting. Well, parents and students have been increasingly questioning whether their school officials are prepared. After Uvalde, they are now questioning whether their law enforcement officers are prepared to respond to an active shooter in schools. And that's unfortunate. That sentiment after hundreds of law enforcement officers responded to the scene in Texas and an investigative report finding a lack of urgency to take down the gunman. Officers waited for more than an hour to storm the classroom and killed the shooter. Experts say schools and police agencies nationwide are now making things like active shooter drills and safety school training more public and transparent in response. So there is a strong effort across the country by schools and law enforcement officers to reassure parents, students, their school communities. Yes, we're prepared. We have trained, in this case, to the single officer entry, and we are ready, if necessary, to go in and implement that. Now, following Uvalde, all Texas school districts conducted a safety audit of every single campus, checking all doors and locks, some schools adding cameras and perimeter fencing. Schools nationwide taking the summer to revise and beef up their own campus security. Some start this month, like in Florida, Ohio, and Tennessee. In Washington, Ryan Smith for the National Desk. Giving travelers more rights. Still to come, the federal government's new rules to hold airlines accountable if they cancel your flight. Plus, addiction alert. What authorities say teenagers are now using to get their nicotine fix and why it's so dangerous. The National Desk team of reporters bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America and we start in Florida where travelers are now reacting to a transportation department proposal that could put money in your pocket if your flight is delayed or canceled. Bonnie Whitler booked a flight for a family wedding back in July. This was the first time she would be seeing her family all together since tragedy struck and she lost her son over a year ago. But this weekend, Whitler would be one of thousands facing delays and cancellations. We landed in Dallas. That connection, that connecting flight was delayed once, twice, three times. Then we finally get on the plane. Willer says the pilot made an announcement to deboard the plane before finally canceling the flight because there was no co-pilot. Willer tried again the next day to make it to Oregon with no success. On Friday, FlightAware says more than 1,200 flights were canceled across the U.S. Just last week, the Department of Transportation announced a new proposal that would give consumers more protection when it comes to cancellations and refunds for domestic and international flights. The Department of Transportation proposal would force airline ticket agents to provide refunds when a carrier has canceled or altered a flight. If a voucher is issued, it would no longer have an expiration date. Those vouchers would also be given to passengers unable to travel because of a severe infectious disease like COVID. While most of these rules have been in place for years, airlines have been inconsistent in following them. This new policy will make them more clear to the airlines and travelers like Whitler. In Alabama, teens are turning to gummies after the FDA changed the legal age to buy tobacco and nicotine products to 21. Virginia Guy with the Drug Education Council says even though these gummies contain synthetic nicotine, the long-term effects right now are unknown. She's encouraging parents to talk to their children before they experiment with nicotine, saying their developing brains are more susceptible to addiction. 
these kids want to take risks, they want to try things. So I think that's just a natural part of growing up and developing. And so I think the most important thing is for parents to talk to their children about this and, you know, not to freak out, but to, um, to have conversations. Guy says 90% of addictions start in the teen years. In Washington, Seattle residents are planting community gardens where homeless encampments once were in an effort to deter crime. Neighbors say a deadly shooting in a growing homeless camp inspired them to take action and set up gardens so that tents cannot be pitched in their neighborhood. Well, this idea is now catching on in other neighborhoods dealing with similar problems. We didn't set out to do this garden project. I think we were all pretty just desperate to keep the neighborhood safe. While the neighbors enjoy these gardens, they say the city needs to step up and take some action against crime. The professional golf playoffs teed off this week, and you may have heard about the ongoing controversy between the American Tour and the Saudi-backed Live Tour, who's offering golfers millions in guaranteed contracts. Our fact check team looks at other investments Saudi Arabia has been making and the motivation behind those. Saudi Arabia's Sovereign Wealth Fund has invested $2 billion in the Live Golf Series, but we wanted to know what else they use their money for. So I'm back tonight with our fact check team. Connor, we know there's been a lot of controversy surrounding the Live Golf Series, but this country has made other investments right here in the United States. That's right. In fact, just last year, Saudi Arabia's public investment fund held about $56 billion worth of U.S. listed stocks like Uber and Pinterest and Lucid, which makes electric cars. And now they're also bidding for a stake in Starbucks. And Connor, some are now asking why the criticism is just now surfacing regarding some of these investments when there's been so much opposition fierce opposition already to the Live Golf Series. Right, and it does seem a little odd, but this sponsorship is a little different because they've created an entirely new tour that's in direct competition with the PGA. So it's like you're choosing between the U.S. or Saudi Arabia. And this is just something to keep in mind. Some of these PGA athletes are also sponsored by brands like Nike, who has had its own human rights issues with forced labor. Very good point there. So, Janae, does this golf series make Saudi Arabia a lot of money? This actually isn't a moneymaker. So this year, Live Golf offered $255 million in prize money, but it doesn't have an international TV contract and it can't make that money back from ticket sales alone. So then why are they potentially willing to lose money in this investment? So they're being accused of sports washing and that's a term that i just learned today it's only been commonly used in the past five years now it's when a country uses sports to improve their reputation build influence or even distract from human rights violations so human rights activists thinks saudi arabia has tried to sports wash their reputation with live golf and other investments like english premier league soccer by buying a majority stake in newcastle now the newcastle united takeover was met with opposition from human rights groups but the premier league received assurances that the club would not be under any sort of control of Saudi Arabia. Following the money tonight for important context on this story, Janine and Connor, thank you so much. The Fact Check team will continue to follow developments on this and several other important issues. You can also read this story with links to where they found all of their information on our website, thenationaldesk.com. Still to come, viruses circulating the country from COVID to monkeypox and now polio. What parents need to know to keep their kids healthy as they head back to school. A doctor weighs in next. Keep it here. You're watching the National Desk, America's News Now. A change in CDC COVID-19 guidelines this week you need to know about. The six-foot social distancing recommendation now replaced with a suggestion that individuals evaluate their individual exposure risk based on their setting and their community levels of transmission. Quarantining no longer recommended for people simply exposed to the virus. And the recommendation for exposed students to regularly test to stay in class has also been removed. Well, first came COVID, now monkeypox and something else, a new concern now over polio as students head back to class. Our Megan O'Halloran spoke with Dr. Erica Aragona to discuss all three viruses, starting with monkeypox and the Biden administration's decision to divide a single dose of the vaccine for it in an effort to protect more people. 
We certainly hope that it will help with the spread of the virus, especially because we have vaccines that are so in demand right now. So the FDA just issued an emergency use of authorization for that vaccine for 18 years and up. And it's intradermal, which means kind of like in between the layers of the skin and two doses, four weeks apart. What does this mean? It's a less amount. We're hoping to increase the number of vaccines because of this. The drawback, since you asked that question, is we don't have great research right now if it will be fully effective. The best thing that we can do is get the vaccine to as many people at high risk as possible and hope for the best and hopefully we'll get more vaccines while we're waiting. Well, many students heading back to school in the coming weeks. Do you predict an uptick in COVID cases and how can parents keep their kids safe and out of the quarantine cycle this new school year? Yeah, I'm getting this question a lot. <laughs> It's hard because it's it's valid, right? Even before COVID, we had cold and flu season. We know when you're in close contact, things tend to spread. So the best thing that we can do as we anticipate more cases of COVID, of other communicable illnesses, is really educate. I encourage patients to communicate with their schools effectively. Know their policies, know their plans, you know, communicate with their teachers. If you have a child who has any symptoms, keep them home. And before anything else, make sure you're vaccinated. Make sure your children are up to date on all all of their pediatric vaccines, not just COVID. We've got so many other illnesses emerging. What we wanna do is protect and then also prevent. And how do we do that? Wash hands, stay away from anybody who's showing signs of symptoms that could be contagious and really communicate with your schools. Cause I get it scary, I'm a parent. Mm -hmm. We want parents to feel comfortable sending their kids back. And the best way to do that is through education and communication with the schools. Yeah, yeah we should really know the drill by now. And I'm just curious uh, on your day to day, do you encounter a lot of parents uh, with some pushback or hesitancy still refusing to vaccinate their children? I do. I actually do a lot, more than I am comfortable to, to say that I see. And honestly, you know what we need to do is meet parents with respect and autonomy. I think I get a much better success when I extend my reasoning as a doctor. I've taken care of their children for years. They've trusted my medical expertise. Why would it be any different now? But if we force something, nobody wants to do what they're just told to do. Why not meet them with education and also a sense of care for their kid? Listen, I recommend this. I'd like you to make the decision, yeah. but I care about you and here's why. So if we meet them with a sense of autonomy, I think we get a lot better response. Yeah, that's a great uh, compassionate uh, approach there. Let's switch gears here. This is an interesting news headline uh, circulating out there. A new concern when it comes to polio here in the U.S. One man in New York contracting the disease and school-aged children in London now being offered boosters after the virus was detected in sewage. Is there reason for concern here? Yeah, I mean, think about it. Polio was discovered over 100 years ago, right? The vaccine came out in 1955. We didn't eradicate it, but we surely got rid of it by vaccinating everybody that we could. The 20-year-old male patient who tested positive, unfortunately, was not vaccinated. And what we're seeing is a huge concern that this can be fecally spread through the sewage system. So potentially a lot of people were exposed in New York. So are we concerned? Yeah, I mean, we thought polio was gone, or at least we knew how to treat it and vaccinate against it. So now we're seeing monkeypox, COVID, and polio. It's a so lot. all I want as a take home is this, we need to vaccinate. But again, I don't wanna create fear. You know, we need to create education. So if you have questions, ask your doctor, look online. There's great resources on the American Academy of Pediatrics for parents to go to if they have questions. Instead of the fear, let's meet it with education because we can beat this if we work together, we're not afraid. That's a great way to look at it. Dr. Erica, always a pleasure. Thanks for coming back on the show tonight. Thanks so much, Megan. And still to come, high stakes primary elections. The big names on the ballot next week in two major states.
Taking a look at the top trending stories on our website now. In Boise, Idaho, the sheriff's office investigating after a woman was attacked by three people in a beach parking lot. In South Carolina, the death of a hospital employee ruled a homicide. The woman died after being hit in the groin during an altercation with a patient. In Florida, an attack caught on camera. A man brutally beaten by a group of people who cut in front of him in line. Police still searching for the suspects. Those stories and more available right now at thenationaldesk.com. Still to come, a man charged in an assassination plot targeting two top former U.S. officials. Who the Department of Justice is now looking for and a new warning from the White House. You're watching The National Desk, America's News Now. Watch us live weekdays, 6 a.m. till 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. till midnight Eastern Time and anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We're back after this. The National Desk, America's News, now. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Eugene Ramirez. Right now, an escalating border crisis. Buses of migrants arriving in New York City from Texas. The Texas Initiative adding to a growing feud between New York City Mayor Eric Adams and Texas Governor Greg Abbott. Adams calling the policy cruel, saying he now wants to send buses full of New Yorkers to Texas to campaign for Abbott's Democratic challenger, Beto O'Rourke. Well, Texas has sent at least an estimated 4,000 people to New York since May. The city says that's stretching its social programs and shelters thin. In his response, Texas Governor Greg Abbott saying Mayor Adams has no idea what Texas deals with, adding despite its sanctuary city policy, New York City can't handle even a fraction of the chaos Biden has created. Now, after the Supreme Court's ruling last month that the Biden administration can end the Remain in Mexico immigration policy, we're now learning more about the Department of Homeland Security's plan to roll it back. The National Desk, Zatra Elnashar, with what happens next and what it means for an immigration system both parties agree needs fixing. The result of a legal battle more than a year in the making taking effect this week. The Department of Homeland Security formally ending the Remain in Mexico Trump era policy requiring asylum seekers to wait in Mexico until their court hearing in the U.S. In an announcement Monday night, the DHS reiterates the administration's belief the policy, quote, has endemic flaws, imposes unjustifiable human costs, and pulls resources and personnel away from other priority efforts to secure our border. One of the challenges is it involves the synchronization of many organizations outside of just CBP and DHS to make it work. Earlier this year, a top Customs and Border Protection official told lawmakers on Capitol Hill that restarting the policy after a judge reversed President Biden's pause was a massive undertaking. Many Republicans, like Texas Senator John Cornyn, say the policy deterred illegal crossings. CBP already reporting a record 1.7 million encounters at the southwest border this fiscal year. We know that as long as the green light is out and the welcome mat is out, that people will continue to come to the United States illegally. It's unclear whether there will be a significant impact on border operations without this policy. Fewer than 6,000 people were subject to the policy between December of last year and this past June, according to the DHS, compared to about 70,000 during the Trump administration. Often used instead of remain in Mexico since the pandemic was Title 42, which will remain in place under a separate court order, meaning individuals encountered at the southwest border who cannot establish a legal basis to remain in the United States will be removed or expelled. Democrats and Republicans stuck in gridlock on how to reform the immigration system. Tensions recently spilled over as Texas Governor Greg Abbott sends buses of migrants to New York City and here in Washington, D.C. He claims it's partly to relieve border 
communities, while Democrats accuse him of using migrants as political pawns. On Capitol Hill, I'm Atrel Najjar for The National Desk, America's News Now. Right now, Americans are divided over immigration policy. A new Gallup poll found 27% of Americans say immigration should be increased. 31% believe it should be kept at the current level. 38% want fewer migrants entering the U.S. Now, in the past two years, the desire to see immigration decrease has gone up. This week, the White House warning Iran of severe consequences for attacks on any U.S. citizen. This comes after the Justice Department charged an Iranian operative who allegedly planned to assassinate at least two former U.S. officials. The DOJ now looking for Shuram Porsafi, a member of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. U.S. officials say he plotted to kill former National Security Advisor John Bolton and former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. This was not an idle threat. And this is not the first time we have uncovered brazen acts by Iran to exact revenge against individuals on U.S. soil. The DOJ says the plot is believed to be payback for the January 2020 airstrike that killed an Iranian general. Well, this week, our Jan Jeffcoat sat down with former National Security Advisor John Bolton, who shared how he found out about this plot against him. So you've been in high-level national security and diplomatic positions for many years. You've served directly under three presidents, most recently as President Trump's national security advisor. When did you hear about this plot, and were you briefed on how close this was to actually happening? Well, I first heard about it from the FBI in uh, early 2020, uh, pursuant to what the FBI calls its duty to warn program when an American citizen uh, is threatened uh, from foreign sources. Uh, and they continued to brief me over the course of uh, 2020, 2021, as the warning became more acute until we got to the uh, point uh, in, in late uh, 2021 when uh, I said, if, if the uh, circumstances are this uh, serious, perhaps it's time to ask uh, whether it would be appropriate for the Secret Service to come in, which is, which is what the FBI then did. And 45-year-old Shamran Porsafi, who is also a member of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard, does remain at large, presumably, in Iran this morning. I was looking at some court documents this morning detailing that this guy knew, he knew where you were, uh, he knew when you were at these places, which would have not been known through public sources. He knew your schedule. He even suggested to the informant that the hit should be made in a parking garage. Had you had any warnings about this specifically, and are you in hiding right now? No, I'm I'm not in hiding. I'm in my office uh, in the same building uh, that the parking lot is in. Uh, you know, this is, uh, uh, I think, a circumstance that is uh, one of the important aspects of unsealing the documents that uh, the court and the Justice Department did yesterday so that people can see uh, in considerable detail uh, the extent to which the government in Tehran was prepared to go uh, to carry out this assassination attempt. Uh, this this is not really about me uh, because there are many people uh, who have been subject to this uh, kind of threat not not just people who have served in senior government positions but uh, but typical american citizens who express uh, points of view that the government of iran doesn't like so it tells you a lot about the nature of the government in tehran and uh, i think should inform uh, our understanding of the administration's efforts to go back into the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. There is zero chance, in my view, that the government will uh, meet any obligations it undertakes. Given that it's trying to kill Americans on American soil, it's time to halt these negotiations and face up to reality. So how should the U.S. respond to this threat? What would you like to see? Well, I think it's very important, uh, not just that we respond to actual attacks by Iran, but that we make it clear that uh, we're prepared to continue to take steps to prevent them from happening. I would not lessen any sanctions on Iran, whatever related to the nuclear program uh, or to their prior acts of terrorism. Uh, and I'd stiffen the enforcement of what we already have. Remember, this is nothing new for this government. Virtually the first thing the Islamic Revolution did in 1979 when it overthrew the Shah of Iran was seize the American embassy in Tehran and hold our diplomats hostage. They followed that up with an attack uh, through a Lebanese group on the Marine barracks in Lebanon in 1983. They have killed Americans in uh, Iraq, civilian and military, through attacks by Shia militia groups and uh, rocket and drone attacks. Uh, they, they've killed a lot of Americans over the past 40 years, and uh, now, they're, now they're trying to do it on American soil. It's unacceptable, and it's not just a question of sending a strong message. 
uh, I think we've got to take stronger steps, and that includes ditching this forlorn uh, nuclear agreement and, and uh, moving on to something more effective. Yeah, and you resigned from the Trump administration in 2019, so you weren't even involved in the 2020 strike on Soleimani. How would you advise the administration, and why do you think they're after you? Well, the strike, I'll just say this, the strike on Soleimani didn't happen, didn't get put together the day before it happened. Uh, but leaving that aside, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, what this document that was unsealed yesterday demonstrates is the uh, extent to which Iran has acted already. Uh, in my case, but but I feel certain in other cases as well. Uh, so again, it's not enough to warn Iran when actions that threaten Americans are already underway. I don't think we should be waiting for one of the targets of the Iranian government actually to be killed before we respond. You said that getting back into this 2015 nuclear deal encourages these kinds of terrorist activities. How so? Well, I think it shows real weakness on the part of the United States. It was a bad deal when it was signed in 2015. It hasn't gotten any better with age. The Biden administration has spent the last year and a half making more concessions uh, to Iran. Uh, the Iranians have seen their terrorist efforts uh, in the Middle East, not just against Americans, but against the Saudis, the Emiratis and others, allies of the United States, their determination to eliminate Israel entirely. Uh, all of which have not met an effective American response, by which I mean a response that stops Iran from doing these things. So you put all that together and what they see is American weakness. Uh, and what's the most profound insight here is one that uh, Donald Rumsfeld once said, it's not American strength that's provocative, it's American weakness that's provocative. And that's what the Iranians see. I wanna ask you very quickly too, what's happening right now with China. How would you advise the administration at this point well, I think uh, they were wrong to signal uncertainty about House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. This is another sign of weakness that they were afraid of what would happen. Uh, really, the, the Taiwanese situation is, 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 again, only part of the broader threat that China represents along its entire Indo-Pacific periphery uh, and ultimately to the United States. So how we handle Taiwan, whether we stand with this ally of ours against this Chinese belligerence, uh, will have obviously a profound impact on Taiwan, but it will have an impact across the Indo-Pacific and really around the world, uh, whether you can count on the United States when times get tough. And you've said over and over that you think this administration, the current administration is, is seen as very weak in the eyes of the world. At this point, what do you think Biden should do? What should he do in regards to Russia? What should he do in regards to Iran? How should he be responding to all these different countries and the weakness that you say we are showing right now to the rest of the world? Well, I think uh, whether it's China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, you've, you've got to make it clear to them that we do not accept their conduct. There's nothing here to negotiate. But we've made a lot of mistakes already. In the case of Ukraine, we obviously failed to deter the Russian invasion. Uh, we failed to deter uh, China from acting with uh, hostility toward Taiwan. We failed to uh, deter actions that the government of Iran has taken. So, look, it requires support from the American people for a more robust, a harder line foreign policy. But I think our ultimate safety and security depends on that. This should be part of the political debate. Uh, people say it's only the economy that matters or it's this uh, abortion issue or uh, whatever. Uh, really, it's time for uh, candidates for the House and Senate to debate more national security because that really is Without, without a strong American posture in the world, our way of life here at home is threatened. All right, Ambassador John Bolton, we appreciate you joining us this morning here on the National Desk. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. District attorneys around the country are refusing to prosecute abortion in the wake of the Roe v. Wade reversal. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis removed an elected official over this issue. Our fact check team now digs into whether other governors have that same power. Governor Ron DeSantis drawing praise and criticism for suspending one of Tampa's top prosecutors, Andrew Warren. We wanted to know what powers governors can exercise in their respective states. I'm back with our fact check team, Connor and Courtney. Connor, we'll start with you first. Uh, let's start with the basics here. Does Governor Ron DeSantis actually have authority to remove Warren? He does. Now, if you take a look at your screens, you'll see Florida State Constitution gives him the authority to remove state officials if they violate any of those standards you see there, like breaking the law 
or in this case, neglect of duty, which DeSantis said he did for promising not to enforce Florida's abortion bans. Has this been done before? Yes, it has. Many times, previous Florida governors like Rick Scott and Jeb Bush removed state officials, and Charlie Crist once suspended 37 public officials in just 36 months. But DAs are given quite a bit of discretion for what they choose and don't choose to prosecute, so there is a chance for Warren to appeal this, and he's already vowed to do that. Okay, so do other governors have the same power as Governor DeSantis when it comes to removing state officials? It really depends. Each state has different standards, but there are 26 states that give the governor authority to remove other state officials. And unlike Florida, 14 of those states don't even require governors to give a cause for the removal. All right, and Courtney, you looked into some other powers that governors have. What did you find there? We did some digging and we found that every state constitution empowers the governor to veto an entire bill that's been passed by the state legislature. And many constitutions even expand that power by also allowing governors to amend bills. Well, have we seen any governors exercise this power recently? We have. Virginia Governor Youngkin has vetoed more bills in his first year than we saw with the past five administrations. And with elections coming up in November, other candidates across the country have signaled that they would veto any state bills that limit women's access to abortion. Right. Courtney and Connor, thank you both. Our fact check team will continue to follow developments on these and other issues. You can also read this story with links on where the two found their information. It's all on our website. Just go to thenationaldesk.com. A surprise for seniors. Coming up, how beagle puppies saved from lab research are now serving a greater purpose, helping others. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. Our team of nearly 4,000 local journalists bringing you the headlines from coast to coast, from dogs rescued from a lab now helping Virginia seniors, to the Field of Dreams game boosting business in Iowa. We're taking the pulse of America. We start with bats taking over an Ohio preschool. First, I thought it might be a joke. Bats in this barn gave her daughter the boot from preschool. She also has some speech delays that the school really helped her with last year. So I was hoping before she transitioned into kindergarten. We believe the bats are in the ceiling uh, of the barn and uh, the sidewalls. Grove City's deputy administrator found out about the bat colony three weeks ago. Parents received this email letting them know preschools canceled for the year. The roofs coming off the barn next week, then the city will wait for hundreds of bats to move out. The waste of the bats uh, contaminate the building. There are bat bugs, uh, which is a parasite, like a bed bug, but they attach the bats. In the meantime, there's nowhere for the 110 enrolled students to go for preschool. The city sent families a list of daycares in Grove City. Either it's, you know, the price isn't there feasible or they're full. Just when you thought the beagles rescued from the Invigo breeding facility in Virginia couldn't possibly get any cuter, they're taking a field trip, making some new friends at a nursing home in Fairfax County. Oh, I like it. I like puppies. I haven't had one in a long time. The staff here at ProMedica Skilled Nursing had heard about the ongoing mission to save 4,000 beagles that were bred to be sold to labs for experimentation. And so they reached out to Homeward Trails Animal Shelter to ask whether any of the recently rescued pups might be able to stop by here. There's nothing more fun or that would bring joy to the residents than having some puppies visit. Both puppies and people soaking up every second. Very warm, cuddly, wanting to be held, like being held. Oh, we used to have a beetle and it's so nice to see a, a puppy again. I love puppies. For the second year in a row, Dyersville is welcoming in Major League fans from all over. It's a, a cute little town, you know, it's the kind of town that baseball likes. Joanne and Scott Neesmith drove eight hours from Kentucky. Coming here to this and, and seeing the movie, you feel like 
you're in a kind of a cool, special place. It is something special for local businesses. Business has been crazy for like the last week. Jennifer Raker's clothing shop has seen a steady stream of fans needing new gear to rep their team or commemorate their trip. We have so much more to offer and baseball is what drives everybody to our town to see everything else that we have to offer. That first MLB game last year kept people coming long after the final out. It's not just for this week. This is a whole year long of business for us that people come throughout the whole year to visit Field of Dreams. Even, you know, people from Iowa that didn't know that Field of Dreams was here, you know, last year they're like, oh, we didn't know this was a thing and they started coming in. Signs the U.S. economy could be turning around. From new inflation numbers to gas prices, our team of correspondents breaking down this week in Washington after this. Our Washington Bureau covers Capitol Hill and D.C. every day to report on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. Two of our correspondents, Atra Elnishar and Kayla Gaskins, are here with us to share their insights and analysis. Atra, let's begin with you. For the first time in a long time, new inflation numbers were not as bad as expected. Does this mean that we're past the worst of those soaring prices? Well, Scott, it is too soon to tell, but you're right. This inflation report that came out this week was significantly better than people expected. When's the last time you heard somebody say that? Uh, what we learned is that in July, Americans paid about 8.5% more for everyday goods than they paid in July of 2021. Now, usually... Eight and a half percent inflation would be shocking. It would be it would it would probably cause markets to crash uh, if it came out of nowhere. But we saw the opposite uh, this week. Wall Street absolutely rallied because eight and a half percent annual inflation rate is a huge improvement from the nine point one percent that we saw in June. Also, later in the week, we found out that the producer price index, which is like an inflation measure uh, for wholesalers, also declined significantly. Uh, so Wall Street had a great week upon this news uh, because it could indicate that what the Federal Reserve is doing is working and that they might not have to act so aggressively. Now, a main driver of these inflation decreases, no pun intended, is gas. It fell about 7.7% uh, in July. Plane tickets are also down by about the same amount. However, food prices are still up, electricity costs are up, and people are really sour about the economy, even in polls that were taken after these price declines that I just mentioned that happened in July. So basically, it's too soon to tell. Of course, if we have hit peak inflation, it's got to start somewhere. Perhaps this week's numbers were it, but we'll get a better idea next month. Uh, quickly, though, if you can, you talked about gas prices. A lot of people judge their wallet based on what they're paying at the yeah. pump. Should we expect this to be a trend, this downward cycle? Well, unfortunately, oil prices have ticked up uh, later in the week, so that could be a sign that prices after this decline, we've seen about 60 days straight of falling gas prices, that it, it could increase. We're getting mixed reports, though, from OPEC and other uh, uh, petroleum analysts about where demand is going and where supply is going. It just seems like a mixed bag, but right now there's no clear sign that these declines will continue. All right. Thank you, Atra. Meanwhile, Kayla, some disturbing news this week about a plot to assassinate top U.S. officials. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so this centers around an assassination plot for Ambassador John Bolton, and it gets scarier the more you dig into the details. So this alleged plot is payback for the United States killing of General Qasim Soleimani back in January of 2012. Remember, Soleimani was killed by a U.S. drone strike when he was at the Baghdad airport. The Pentagon said Soleimani was responsible for the deaths of hundreds of Americans. So now Iran was planning to go after John Bolton as a form of retaliation, we're learning. And Bolton has been a prominent critic of Iran. He was a driving force behind President Trump's maximum pressure campaign on the country. He also pushed really hard for the United States to get out of the Iran nuclear deal, which President Trump did listen to his advice and he withdrew from in 2018. Uh, so who is responsible for this? The DOJ is zeroing in on the Iranian Sharam for uh, for a shy, excuse me, and he's charged with this plot. DOJ documents, uh, the charging documents show that he had a murder for hire plot. He was trying to pay someone $300,000 for the hit on Bolton in the DC and Maryland uh, metro area. Obviously that plot was foiled. Um, 
Bolton found out about it back in 2020, and we are just learning about it as the public now. Yeah, more to learn there. All right, thank you, Atra, Kayla, we appreciate it. Eugene, back to you. Great insight from our Capitol Hill team. Thank you, guys. Still to come, Serena's send-off. Tennis legend Serena Williams announcing this week her retirement, when she will compete in her very last match, and the reason she's stepping away from the sport. Next. Tennis legend Serena Williams announcing this week she will be retiring. The 40-year-old plans to step away from tennis after the U.S. Open, which runs from late August through September. Williams says it's time to focus on her expanding family and raising her four-year-old daughter. The tennis star has 73 career single titles, 23 career double titles, and more than $94 million in career winnings. That's it for us on this weekend edition of the National Desk, America's News Now. Don't forget you can watch live weekdays 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. till midnight Eastern time. Check your local listings. You can also watch and keep up with the latest headlines online at thenationaldesk.com. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Eugene Ramirez. Have a great rest of your weekend.